Hi guys, today we're gonna read the story Mrs. Packletide's Tiger by Hector Hugh Munro, aka Saki. The story is about a vain woman who shoots a tiger to be famous than her rival, but gets snubbed later by blackmail. Let's commence, shall we? It was Mrs. Packletide's pleasure and intention that she should shoot a tiger. Not that the lust to kill has suddenly descended on her, or that she felt that she would leave India safer and more wholesome than she had found it with one fraction less of wild beasts per million of inhabitants. The compelling motive for her sudden deviation towards the footsteps of Nimrod was the fact that Luna Bimberton had recently been carried 11 miles in an aeroplane by an Algerian aviator and talked of nothing else. Only a personally procured tiger skin and a heavy harvest of press photographs could successfully counter that sort of thing. Mrs. Packletide had already arranged in her mind the lunch she would give at her house on Curzon Street, ostensibly in Luna Bimberton's honour, with a tiger skin rug occupying most of the foreground and all of the conversation. She had also already designed in her mind the tiger claw brooch that she was going to give Luna Bimberton on her next birthday. In a world that's supposed to be chiefly swayed by hunger and by love, Mrs. Packletide was an exception. Her movements and motives were largely governed by dislike of Nuna Bimberton. Circumstances proved propitious. Mrs. Packletide had offered a thousand rupees for the opportunity of shooting a tiger without overmuch risk or exertion, and it so happened that a neighbouring village could boast of being a favoured rendezvous of an animal of respectable antecedents, which had been driven by the increasing infirmities of age to abandon game killing and confine its appetite to the smaller domestic animals. The prospect of earning the thousand rupees had stimulated the sporting and commercial instinct of the villagers. Children were posted night and day on the outskirts of the local jungle to head the tiger back in the unlikely event of his attempting to roam away to fresh hunting grounds. And the cheaper kinds of goats were left with elaborate carelessness to, he to keep him satisfied with his present quarters. The one great anxiety was that was lest he should die of old age before the date appointed for the Mem Sahib's shoot. Mothers carrying their babies home through the jungle after the day's work in the fields hushed their singing, lest they might curtail the restful sleep of the venerable herd robber. The great night duly arrived, moonlit and cloudless. A platform had been constructed in a comfortable and conveniently placed tree, and thereon crouched. Mrs. Packletide and her paid companion, Miss Mebib, a goat gifted with a particularly persistent bleat, such as even a partially deaf tiger might be reasonably expected to hear on a still night, was tethered at the correct distance. With an accurately sighted rifle and a thumbnail pack of patient guards, the sportswoman awaited the coming of the quarry. I suppose we are in some danger, said Miss Mebib. She was actually not nervous about the wild beast, but she had a morbid dread of performing an atom more service than she had been paid for. Nonsense, said Mrs. Packletide. It's a very old tiger. It couldn't spring up here even if it wanted to. If it's an old tiger, I think you ought to get it cheaper. A thousand rupees is a lot of money. Louisa Mebin adopted a protective, elder sister attitude towards money in general, irrespective of nationality or denomination. Her energetic intervention had saved many a roble from depleting itself in tips in some Moscow hotel, and francs and centimes clung to her instinctively under circumstances which would have driven them headlong from less sympathetic hands. Her speculations as to the market depreciation of tiger remnants were cut short by the appearance on the scene of the animal itself. As soon as it caught sight of the tethered goat, it lay flat on the earth, seemingly less from a desire to take advantage of an all-available cover than for the purpose of snatching a short rest before commencing the grand attack. I believe it's ill, said Louisa Mebin loudly in Hindustani, for the benefit of the village headman who was in ambush in a neighbouring tree. Hush, said Mrs. Packletide, and at that moment, the tiger commenced ambling towards his victim. 
Now, now, urged Miss Mebbin with some excitement. If he doesn't touch the goat, we needn't pay for it. The bait was an extra. The rifle flashed out with a loud report and the great tawny beast sprang to one side and then rolled over in the stillness of death. In a moment, a crowd of excited natives had swarmed on to the scene and their shouting speedily carried the glad news to the village where a thumping of tom-toms took up the chorus of triumph and their triumph and rejoicing formed a ready echo in the heart of Mrs. Packletai. Already that luncheon party in Curzon Street seemed immeasurably nearer. It was Louisa Mebbin who drew attention to the fact that the goat was in death throes from a mortal bullet wound, while no trace of the rifle's deadly work could be found on the tiger. Evidently, the wrong animal has been hit and the beast of prey had succumbed to heart failure caused by the sudden report of the black rifle accelerated by senile decay. Mrs. Packletide was pardonably annoyed at the discovery, but at any rate, she was the possessor of a dead tiger and the villagers, anxious for their thousand rupees, gladly connived at the fiction that she had shot the beast. And Miss Mebbin was a paid companion. Therefore, Mrs. Packletide faced the cameras with a light heart and her pictured fame reached from the pages of the Texas Weekly Snapshot to the illustrated Monday supplement of the Novo Remya. As for Luna Bimberton, she refused to look at an illustrated paper for weeks and her letter of thanks for the gift of a tiger claw brooch for a, of a tiger claw brooch was a model of repressed emotions. The luncheon party she declined. There are limits beyond which repressed emotions become dangerous. How amused everyone would be if they knew what really happened, said Louisa Mebbin a few days after the ball. What do you mean? asked Mrs. Packletide quickly. How you shot the tiger and how you shot the goat and frightened the tiger to death, said Miss Mebbin with her disagreeably pleasant laugh. No one would believe it, said Mrs. Packletide, her face changing colour as rapidly as though it were going through a book of patterns before post time. Luna Bimberton would, said Miss Mebbin. Mrs. Packletide's face settled on an unbecoming shade of greenish white. You surely wouldn't give me away, she asked. I've seen a weekend cottage near Darkin that I should rather like to buy," said Miss Mebbin with seeming irrelevance. 680 freehold, quite a bargain, only I don't happen to have the money. Louisa Mebbin's pretty weekend cottage, christened by her, less Forbes, and gay in summertime with its garden borders of tiger lilies is the wonder and admiration of her friends. It's a marvel how Louisa manages to do it is the general verdict. Mrs. Packletide indulges in no more big game shooting. The incidental expenses are so heavy, she confides to inquiring friends. And that's the end of the story. I hope you enjoyed it, didn't you? For more useful content, please support this channel by subscribing to it as well as liking our videos. All suggestions are welcome in the comment section below. Ta-ta for now!